thank you everybody for coming um, to this presentation by Dr. Matthews. Um, my name is Jeffrey Smith. You know, we have the Master Gardener Association and we've invited some garden clubs to come and a few other folks. So thank everybody for coming and I'll just let Dr. Matthews have the program. It's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Okay, we hope so. Boy, they put a lot of, got of confidence in me. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Janet Matthews, and I want to thank Jeffrey and Ellen and David and, and everybody who's allowed me to be here this morning and share this with you because I think it's really exciting. And um, just a little bit about me. I am uh, an OBGYN physician, and I uh, work as an OB hospitalist at the hospital here, which means that every other week I'm here to deliver babies and take care of whatever pregnant patients come in so um, I'm and on the in between weeks I live in Virginia Beach which is actually my home so I drive back and forth um, most of my dye plants that I grow are in my garden in Virginia Beach uh, but I do have a bed here for those who don't know you're welcome to, to walk back and take a look and I've got a, a picture here on your handout too uh, where I've grown uh, some of the dye plants and uh, you can see up here some of the some of the colors that I've gotten from the the garden. Um, I always get asked how did I get interested in this. Um, I started out, uh, I learned to sew and, and knit as a small child and have always been a knitter but I was always wanted to get involved in weaving and, um, and was also kind of interested in natural dyeing. I've heard about it but I you know, wasn't sure. Um, about four years ago, a little over four years ago, I took a class at uh, the John C. Campbell Folk School, which if you're not familiar with the John C. Campbell Folk School, talk to, look, I see some nods here, talk to these people who are nodding. It's an amazing place. Um, so the first class I took there was on uh, natural dyeing and we did some silk screening, which if you look here, this is one of the things that I made uh, silk screen with some natural dyes. Um, the next class I took there was weaving and where I learned to weave on a, on a large floor loom, uh, which I do I have my floor loom there in Virginia Beach. Um, and then just this year, just this past year, I've gotten interested in tapestry weaving. Um, and my focus right now is dyeing the yarns that I need for my tapestry weaving. And all these yarns you see in front of you, all these colors are, um, they're actually a tapestry yarn that um, I order and Jeffrey wanted to know where I ordered them from. These particular yarns are from Harrisville Designs, which is in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you just go online to search Harrisville Designs. But um, I, I chose these particular yarns because they're specifically tapestry yarns. But any undyed yarn, um, any fabrics, you see this is cotton. Um, these two are silk. Um, and this is, a, this is a technique that's called eco printing, um, which is another branch that you can kind of branch off into. I won't be talking much about that today because there's too much, so much else to talk to. Um, in fact, um, I wanted, really wanted to, to title this talk more than you ever thought you wanted to know about <laughs> natural dyeing because once you start talking about natural dyeing, and, and it's the same with a lot of fiber arts, once you start talking about weaving, um, and I'm sure it applies to, to a lot of other things in life. Once you start looking into something and you really get interested, you just go down a rabbit hole and there's, there's really no end. So I'll just give you a little introduction here. Uh, your handout has some resources to explore further. Um, and if you're interested, then, then go for it, go for it. Um, what is natural dyeing? The definition that's given by Catherine Ellis, and Catherine Ellis is sort of the, the queen of natural dyeing. She's, she's the author of one of the books that I have over here that you're welcome to look through at the end. Um, Catherine Ellis says, natural dyeing is a process of coloring textiles with dye from plants or insects. That's kind of a very narrow definition because there, you can also use, um, some people use um, soils. Some people can dye with soils. And every time I walk out here, I see this red dirt here, and I think, ooh, that, would, that might be really nice. Uh, other minerals that you can use to dye with. Um, 
a lot of people are very, very interested in dyeing with lichens and mushrooms which I haven't really gotten into, but that's a, another one of those rabbit holes you can go down. Um, and you can't, you can dye things other than textiles. I was already asked about paper. We'll get that. Um, you can dye paper with natural dyes. Uh, some people dye leather with their natural dyes. Uh, people have dyed, dyed wool, uh, I mean, sorry, wood. Um, and even in a few cases, I've heard of people dyeing their hair with natural dyes, which I wouldn't recommend, but it can be done. Um, some people dye uh, basket materials. There are basket weavers who will dye their, their basket materials with natural dyes. Um, as I said, my practice is that I'm right, right now primarily dyeing wool. Um, if you look, I have this uh, sample book down at the end. Usually when I try a new dye, I put in samples of other fabrics. So I put in uh, a sample of cotton, a sample of linen, a sample of wool, and a sample of silk. And because dyes react differently in different sorts of materials. So uh, my sample book is uh, uh, an example. It, it's, it's my record of all of those experiments that I've done. Um, what I, when I dye larger amounts, though, other than just the samples, what I'm dyeing right now is the wool for the tapestry. And that what I use for myself is plants that I've either grown myself or that I can forage on my, on my land or, in one case, uh, my neighbor's land. You, <laughs> if you look here, uh, I have some yarn that's labeled Lisa's, Lisa's Mushrooms. Um, I have a neighbor who had a, a huge mushroom growing in her yard that was sort of a reddish brown, and she said, oh, you've got to die with this. So I said, okay, I'll die with Lisa's Mushrooms. So in that case, I went off, went, went off base a little bit. Um, but I have a black walnut tree in my yard, and I have an extensive um, yard in Virginia Beach where I grow uh, lots and lots of dye plants. Um, when you think about natural dyes, and, and this came up with, with, I was thinking about baskets, Indians, you see, you see traditional Indian rugs, traditional, uh, and then we're talking about uh, Native American uh, Indian baskets, things like that. Those are all natural dyes. They didn't have synthetic dyes. Um, if you look at your, the first page of your handout, first you'll see, you'll see a couple of pictures of, of my garden here. And then at the bottom you see, you see um, a picture of, on the l bottom left, that's the Hall of the Bulls. And this is from about 15,000 BC. Those pigments are, uh, they think, primarily mineral pigments. So people knew about natural dyeing thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. On the right, there's a textile from Peru from um, somewhere between 200 and 600 BC. And those, that's, obviously it's a current photo. Those colors are still vibrant. Um, most likely that red came from uh, an insect. There's a small insect that, that feeds on cactus that uh, gives a really brilliant red uh, when it's dried and crushed. So I, I also do a lot of reading, and anytime I read a book that is set uh, or was written before the mid-19th century, and they talk about what people are wearing, my first question is, what did they dye that with? <laughs> what, where, how did they get that color? You know, and. Uh, uh, in a lot of cases, we don't know. There, there are natural dye sources that have, have been completely forgotten and, or that we don't use anymore. Uh, there's a species of um, a sea snail that was used, uh, murex, the murex sea snail, was used for purple. So when you read about royal purple, they're talking about s dye from a tiny, tiny little gland in a very small little snail. So it took thousands and thousands and thousands of snails to have enough 
purple dye to dye an item of clothing and that's why that was reserved for royalty because it was very expensive and very rare. Um, in about 1856 was when synthetic dyes were first developed and uh, most of the earliest synthetic dyes were discovered by the pharmaceutical industry because they were looking for ways to make new new uh, medicines to treat things. The very first dye was created when someone was trying to find a way to synthesize um, quinine to treat malaria. Um, you're familiar with Bayer aspirin? The Bayer company, Mr. Adolf Bayer, came up with the very first synthetic indigo dye, blue dye. And, and many, many, and even into the early 20th century, many of the synthetic dyes came to us through the pharmaceutical industry. So we have all these synthetic dyes. Why should we even bother with this? Um, you know, why, why should I knock myself out growing all these plants? I can just get all, I can all get all these colors and just order them. Um, one of the big reasons is that it's, it's healthier and it's better for the environment. Synthetic dyes, give us a lot of toxic chemicals that get dumped. Um, the process is not very clean. Um, the other reasons are more personal. And uh, somebody commented on my t-shirt this morning. My t-shirt says, blessed are the curious for they shall have adventures. <laughs> and that's kind of the theme of natural dying. It's fun. It's, you, <laughs> You really don't know what you're going to get when you pick that plant and dry it and put it in a pot and boil it up and stick your yarn in it. You don't know what color it's going to be. Um, it, it's, it's just so interesting to be able to do that. So not only can you dye the yarn, I showed you already the, the, the uh, screen printing, silk printing. Um, this example here is from a technique that's called eco printing and that is a different branch of natural dyeing where you you lay out your fabric you lay the the leaves or flowers on the fabric you roll it up and steam it and then the imprints of the the leaves or flowers come out on your fabric uh, so you can do all sorts of things with that. It's another rabbit hole to go down. Um, the silk on the end, uh, silk scarf on the very end, uh, was originally dyed with uh, some indigo I grew in my garden, and then I over dyed it with uh, some uh, goldenrod, and so get kind of a green. So you, you can combine colors. You can do all sorts of interesting things with it. Uh, you could even tie dye with it. You could, you could do all sorts of stuff. Um, it's also a great combination that, you know, you're all here, you're all gardeners. Um, if you want to find something else that you can do with your plants or some other focus for your garden, or maybe you got a spot that you don't know quite what to do with, grow some dye plants. They're beautiful. Most of them are flowers. Um, and you can dye with them. What a deal, great. Um, so what plants are dye plants? Um, if you look at the second page of your handout, you'll see I've put some, just some selected plants. Um, what I grew here this year was the Dyer's Coreopsis. The, I, do, I grew some Dyer's chamomile, but it didn't have a very big yield, so I, I didn't bother to pick those. I just let it go. Um, I grew Cosmos. Uh, I grew Marigolds. And I grew uh, the Hopi Black Dye Sunflowers, which you see a, a picture of on the very front. They were incredibly tall. I think they got up to, what would you say, 10 feet yeah. at least? Yeah. Yeah, they were, <laughs> they were huge. Um, and I have to correct one of the things on here. Under the purples, I put Black Knight Scabiosa. Um, I put this on the list before I had tried my Black Knight. Oh, that's another one that I grew over there was the Black Knight Scabiosa. Um, the, the, the flowers are purple. And so I, I had a friend who had died with it. It's got sort of a turquoisey color. So I thought, okay, well, we'll try this. 
the Black Knight Scabiosa gave me uh, this color. <laughs> so you truly don't know what you're going to get. And, and curiously enough, the string that I have this tied with is turquoise. <laughs> so the cotton string dyed turquoise, the wool dyed green. So you just, you just don't know. But most of these are uh, what you can expect to get. You don't always get what you think you're going to get, just like I said there. You don't always use the flower of the plant. Some of these you're going to use the root, the matter under the pinks and reds. Matter is one of the uh, fallback red dyes. It's pretty much one of the very few red dyes that you can get other than the little insect I was talking about. And for that you use the root. Um, for You can get pinks and reds from uh, some inner barks of fruit trees. Now I haven't tried this yet so I can't swear by it but, but I've read multiple reports of people who, who got pinks from those. Um, the Murasaki, the Alkanet, under the purple, those are both are use the roots for the, of the plant to die with. Um, under the, uh, the browns, uh, of course you don't have any brown flowers, so you get uh, the sunflowers, uh, you use the seeds, the black walnut, you use the nuts themselves, the husks of the nuts, the, the uh, dock root, uh, you, again, you use just the root. Um, some plants have really nice color. People talk a lot about red cabbage. Oh, I'm going to die with red cabbage. It's great. It doesn't last. So um, there, there are three different types of dyes that we talk about. Okay. Um, there are um, the dyes that don't last very long, and most of the most berries will fall into that category. So you, you see blueberries or blackberries or something and you think, oh, those will die great. They do, but they don't last. And you say, well, yeah, but you've got pokeweed down here. And, and for those, you use the berries. I'm, that's another one. I can't, I haven't done it. It requires a very elaborate preparation. Um, and uh, people swear that if you do this elaborate stuff with vinegar and, and acidity that you can get it to last. So that's, that's an exception. Um, there are dyes that we call uh, substantive dyes. Those are usually ones that contain tannin. Black walnut is, is a big one of that. Black walnut, acorns, uh, anything that contains tannins. Rhubarb contains tannins. Um, those dyes, you dye with them. They stick to the fabric. They last. They do great. There's also dyes um, that are called adjective dyes. I don't know why they're called, I don't know why they use that name, it's kind of weird. But adjective dyes are most of these that are on this list. They're dyes that you dye with, but if you just use the dye in the, in the textile, they won't stick. They need something else to help them stick. And that something else that we use is something that's called a mordant. And a mordant, the word mordant is from the French word that, to bite. So it's something that bites onto the fabric or the, t the textile, the yarn, and then the dye comes in and bonds with that. So um, most mordants are metal salts, um, aluminum salts like alum. All of these are, are mordanted with alum. So you go through an extra step you treat, treat the textile with your, with your mordant. Um, some people use iron, some people use uh, copper mordants, aluminum, aluminum uh, solutions are usually the most common that are used as mordants. Um, and then once the mordant has bonded with that textile, they, they can dye it and the dye sticks to the fabric and is more permanent and it lasts longer, okay? Some people switch that around a little bit. Some people will put the mordant in with the dye bath and just do a one-step thing. I've never tried that, but I, I hear it can be very successful. Um, there are some 
uh, Eastern practices where they actually mordant after the fact, which I'm not sure how that works, but apparently it does. Um, so you've got your sub sub substantive dyes with tannins, you've got your adjective dyes that need a mordant, and then you got this weird category of vat dyes. The main vat dye is indigo, and you know, you've probably all heard of indigo. They used to grow it in, in uh, the Carolinas years ago, back in colonial America. It used to be a big cash crop. Indigo dye is different in that um, it forms an insoluble pigment. And so you have to go through a process of fermentation in order to uh, dissolve that pigment and, and make it stick to the fabric. And it does not require mordant once it's dissolved and, and you go through the vat process, then it, it dies well. There are some ways to use indigo without going through that whole process. Um, I mentioned ice dyeing. Uh, this, this yarn is, is what's called ice dye. Um, to do that, you take, just take the fresh indigo leaves, you um, put them in a blender with a bunch of ice, literally it's ice, you squish them all up until you've got a, an icy mush and then you strain that and put your fabric in it. Um, and by, by uh, the ice does something chemically, I don't, I don't know. If you want to know the chemistry of it, uh, there's a, the art of, of chemist of natural dyeing down there will tell you all the chemistry of it. But um, it, it releases the, hor the enzyme that breaks down the pigment and somehow makes it available for a very short period of time as long as it's cold. Um, and you can also do salt dyeing where you put your fresh leaves in a bowl, put a bunch of salt in it and just squish it up with your fingers, which is very messy, which I've done. But um, then the salt draws the, um, draws the moisture out of the leaves and then you can squish your, your yarn or your fabric around in the, in the salt solution and, and get a dye. All sorts of ways to do things. Indigo is a really fascinating plant. Um, and it's not just indigo indigo that has the indigo pigment in it. Um, there's also a plant called woad that you'll see listed on here that um, was traditionally grown in the British Isles and Northern Europe that uh, a lot of the blue dye uh, historically has been from woad in those areas. Um, in, that, in that case, it comes from the leaves also. If you notice, if you look at your list of dye plants, um, you'll see that a lot of them end with the word tinctoria. And that's kind of a, a clue if, if a plant's Latin name has tinctoria in it, that then it's, it's almost certain that it has been used at some point in the past as a dye or can be used as a dye now. So that's a good a good hint there. Um, there are other things that change the color, and we talked about you know getting unexpected colors from things. Um, someone was looking at my little sample book earlier and was was commenting on how different the cotton samples are from the other samples. So there's two basic types of textiles that we're looking at: cotton, flax, hemp. Those are cellulose, plant-based fibers, okay? They don't take up dye as well as the other types, which are the animal fibers like wool and silk. Those are protein-based fibers. And um, the protein-based fibers will take up the dye a lot more readily, except in the case of indigo. And in indigo, you see a lot of cotton that's been, been dyed with indigo. Something about the, the affinity of the, the pigment for the cotton uh, just works very well. You especially see especially a lot of Japanese textiles and garments that are indigo dyed on cotton. Um, other things that affect the color, um, what season you pick the flowers or the roots or whatever in, the growing conditions of the plant, what, what minerals, what, what was the weather while the plant was growing, um, the hardness of your water. Uh, different water sources will give you different colors. Um, the amount of time that you process the fiber, the temperature it's processed at, there are just 
a multitude of different uh, different things that will change the colors. This is why it's so exciting because you don't, you never, you can't really control all of those things or you can't really keep track of all of those things and so you really never know. Um, I label all my yarns just so I kind of know but um, you know if I said I'd really like more of this green yarn just this color I have no I, I have no idea I could do the exact same thing that I did to this yarn and who knows what color it's it, it probably would be close to that but it it wouldn't really be about be the same um, the other thing that will really really change your color is something that we call modifiers so a modifier is something that uh, is either added to the dye pot or uh, used to change the pH of the dye pot, the acid, the alkaline balance of the dye pot, uh, or um, as I usually do, you take the dyed textile and dip it or soak it in the modifier. Um, acid and alkaline are some really commonly used modifiers and if you want to poke through these, you'll see some of these have been modified with acids, um, and I just use vinegar. Uh, some of them have been modified with alkaline. This bright orange is an alkaline modified. Um, and I use, um, I use either um, pickling lime or soda ash, so, uh, washing soda, for those to, to get that alkaline uh, environment. Um, you can also modify with uh, things like iron solutions, Iron uh, traditionally is called, does what we call saddening the, the dye. Um, and I like that word, it saddens it, it darkens it usually. Um, some of these have been modified with a copper solution. I, you can buy copper sulfate crystals, you dissolve them in water, dip the, dip the fiber in it, and it will sometimes change the color dramatically. Sometimes not. That's why you experiment and that, that's why you open to uh, interesting results. Um, when you, after you've grown your dye plant, um, sometimes you can use the flowers, the plant tops, whatever, you can use them fresh straight off the plant. Um, goldenrod is a great one for this. In fact, goldenrod I always use fresh because it doesn't, just doesn't give you the same results if you dry it or if you freeze it. Um, all the other dye plants can be dried. Um, in fact, I was telling Jeffrey, I got so many marigolds off my marigold plants this year. I've got several pounds of dried marigolds probably uh, left over even after doing my dyeing. Um, Dried flowers will give you this, the same result as the fresh flower. The, the, drying does not destroy the, the uh, chemical that gives you that color. Um, the roots here um, that you use, those are generally dried. Some of the roots, uh, especially um, I think the alkanet, uh, the dye has to be, is not water soluble, so you have to extract it with alcohol. Uh, some people use vodka even, you know, they'll, they'll put their, grind up their roots and, and soak them in vodka to get the, release the dye. Um, some of the plants, in fact, pretty much all the plants, you can also freeze. Um, my husband gets frustrated with me because our freezer, uh, the freezer compartment of our refrigerator at home is about half full of, of frozen pokeberries. <laughs> so um, you want to... <laughs> You want to label those, make sure nobody eats them. They are not, not, not edible. Um, but when I get around to doing that elaborate process of dying with pokeberries, then they will be just as good as the fresh pokeberries. You get what, just what you would expect. You get that deep, deep red. Yeah. Um, and it probably, even with doing the elaborate vinegar acid procedure. It's probably still not as long lasting as many other dyes, uh, but it's so gorgeous. You just, you got to You got to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you can, you can combine dyes. You can, uh, 
once I get my indigo garden up and going, I didn't have very much indigo this year, but um, once I have a substantial amount of indigo, I could take these yellows and over dye them with indigo and, and get some nice greens out of it. Um, you can also, one of the fun things to do with indigo leaves, if you want, if you're doing the eco printing, you can take the leaf, lay it down and put a, put a piece of cloth or something over it and take a hammer and just whack the heck out of it and the imprint of the leaf will be left on the fabric and that, that will stay. So there, there are all sorts of fun things that you can do. Um, I l gave you a, uh, a list of resources on the back page of your handout. Um, this, this morning, this is just a very brief introduction. I thought about talking about, you know, the exact process of how you do it. You know, you simmer the plants for this long and you do this and this, but there's so many variations on that. Uh, it's best if you're interested in doing this, if you get one of these sources or go to one of the, there's some internet resources here. Um, the books that I use most frequently, I've, I've brought here uh, to kind of show you, you can, you can leaf through them. The one on top is Wild Color. That is very useful because it's, it lists the individual dye plants and what is recommended for each individual dye plant. How much of it you need, uh, do, you, do you heat it, can you do it cold, can you, dye, can you dry it, does it need to be used fresh, all of those little details. The one under it is um, The Art and Science of Natural Dyes. Uh, Catherine Ellis, I mentioned before, is a co-author of that. That is one that goes very deeply into the chemistry of how things work. So Jeffrey, you would probably love that book. Um, she doesn't talk about individual plants, but she has recipes for, for things that I, I have not found anywhere else. For example, uh, she has specific recipes for how to mordant different fibers, how much to use of your alum or whatever you're using. She has uh, a recipe for making what you call a dye lake. So you've you've dyed your fabric and there's still a lot of dye left in that pot you don't want to pour it down the sink there's a way to precipitate it out and store it as a paste she gives a recipe for that she gives just all sorts of, of useful I haven't even begun to explore everything that Catherine Ellis has in that book and then the book on the bottom over there um, I brought for you guys to look through it's not a how-to book but it it has articles about different dye practices from all over the world. So it has pictures of, uh, you know, the Japanese indigo dyers, people from South America who are using different plants and insects down there to dye, and all the gorgeous, gorgeous things that, that they can do all over the world with, with, those, with natural dyeing. So it's definitely worth looking at. And then all these other books here, this is just a sampling. These are, these are not even all the books that I own. I, I own all of these books. I, some of them I didn't put on the list. Um, some of these books have, uh, have little um, projects in them that you can do. So it'll say, you know, use this plant, and it actually gives you um, instructions on how to make uh, a market bag or uh, a hat or, you know, what, whatever the project is, uh, if that's something that interests you. Uh, I put these online uh, resources here, and a lot of them uh, are places where you can also get dye supplies. Um, the one I didn't put on here was the Harrisville, uh, the Harrisville yarn supply. Um, I get my linen and silk from Dharma Trading Company. Uh, they're an excellent source of, of fabrics, and you can get, uh, you can actually get garments from them. You can get t-shirts. You can get baby clothes that are undyed that you can then dye or eco print all sorts of things plus a lot of dye supplies from them uh, Maiwa uh, about halfway down that list uh, sells supplies they also have some excellent excellent online how-to videos and how-to instructions so some of these uh, some of these online sources will let you know you give you all sorts of instructions about how to do things um, at the very bottom, I put my email. If you get interested in this, or if you're just thinking after this talk and say, oh, I forgot to ask 
whatever, email me and I'll, I'll get back to you, I promise. Um, if you're on Facebook, uh, there are multiple, multiple Facebook groups for natural dyeing. There, there are groups for mushroom and lichen dyeing. There are groups for eco printing. There, there, you can, you can ask questions and see examples online of what other people are doing with it and all the different possibilities of that. So just for brief, brief introduction and just a little push down into the rabbit hole. Um, anybody have any questions right, right off the bat that you? Yes, ma'am. You're just in trouble. <laughs> no, um, a lot of the tapestry artists who, who actually make large tapestries and dye their own yarn, they will roughly calculate beforehand how much yarn they need and they'll go ahead and dye that much yarn. Um, so they're usually covered. Otherwise, you improvise. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am. And it's a, uh, the same way any commercial um, yarn that you buy has that dye lock on there. I never could figure out why not the Right, so right. I made a sweater and then I. Oh, Oop, why yep, <laughs> yep. So, yeah, even with synthetic dyes, from one dye lot to the next, it can vary. Yeah. And speaking of synthetics, um, the, the one type of textile that will not dye well is any kind of synthetic. They, they just don't take up dye. So, you know, if you've got some synthetic knitting yarn or something at home, don't bother. Um, and different types of wool will take up dye differently. If you look at my sample book, uh, there's, there are two different types of wool that I've used for the samples. One type was, I, I think, probably a superwash wool. Um, and superwash wool is processed so that the, the outer scale covering of the fiber is removed. Those are much, much darker, uh, took up a lot more dye than, than this type of yarn. So uh, they're a little bit different. The one process that you uh, use to do the salt or the vodka, uh, does perfumes and are made that way in do you get the smell from that? Sometimes. Uh, it doesn't usually last very long. If you know, if you want to sniff these, <laughs> they usually don't smell like much. Um, I, I haven't done much dyeing with mushrooms and lichens, but I, I understand that some of those will give you uh, long-lasting scents, uh, sometimes not all that pleasant, unfortunately. Uh, but I've not had um, any, any scents from the plants really last for very long. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, one last thing. I've been collecting seeds from the plants that I grew here. Um, if any of you are interested, uh, I have plenty of seeds to share. So I've got the um, Hopi Black Dye Sunflower, Coreopsis, Dyer's Coreopsis, uh, Cosmos, Marigolds, and Scabiosa, Black Knight Scabiosa, which does not usually give you purple. Um, <laughs> so Jeffrey has put, oh, I don't know where your pen went. Oh, here it is, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey has donated a, a piece of paper. I'll put it right here. Um, if you're interested in some seeds, I don't have them with me today and I need to package them. Um, just put your name on this list and give me your um, email or phone number, whatever contact information you'd like me to use, um, and I will package those up. If you want just one specific type of seed or if you want all of them, wh whatever, just put that down also and I can share those with you. Anything else? What, what's your favorite color that you like to make? My favorite color? So far, this has just been, this has just blown me away. This is from the Dyer's Coreopsis. 
and the flower of the Dyer's Coreopsis is mainly yellow. It's got a little, a little sort of reddish center on it, but it's mainly yellow. And I just couldn't believe I got that color out of it. It was just, wow. Um, I'm really looking forward to having a lot of indigo next year, though, because indigo is really the fascinating, fascinating thing. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. They had indigo, and they, you know, you can watch the process, and the deepening of the color as they continued to die. Mm -hmm. um, so I bought some, um, I had it at home, which I thought to bring it, but, you know, it, it gets darker if I wash it, it gets darker. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing about indigo. Um, not only is it a vat dye, you have to do the fermentation process usually to get the pigment out, but the pigment, when you, when you put the fabric in and you pull it out, it's green. As the, fa as the pigment oxidizes, it turns blue. So if you want to get deeper and deeper colors, you dip it, bring it out, let it oxidize, dip it again. And you can, they can repeat that, sometimes repeat it multiple, multiple times to get the deeper, deeper blues, just like your shirt. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, you know, it's, it, it was cotton fabrics. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-